King Jesus is his name. Worthy of all praise is our Savior. He's coming soon. Amen. Oh, you can turn that off. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Father. We love you. We love you. We love you. We love you. Come and express your love to him. Come on. He's great, isn't he? He's great. He's majestic. He's, he's wonderful. He's awesome. Oh, he's wonderful. He's our Prince of Peace. He's our great counselor. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Everlasting Father. He is wonderful. Ooh, he is so wonderful. He is so wonderful. You know, um, <clears throat> Paul the Apostle, he said in Philippians chapter 3, 3, he says, we are the circumcision who, who worship in the Spirit. So our worship doesn't come out of the, the realm of reason. It comes right out of our spirit. Amen. And just for a, another couple of minutes, you know, just right out of your spirit, not out of the realm of reasoning. You know, we can come up with many reasons why he is worthy of all praise. But let not the praise come out of here. Let it come out of here. John 4, 24, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. By the spirit, in the spirit. Lift up holy hands in this holy sanctuary. Amen. He's worthy of all praise. Thank him for his integrity. Thank him for his, his nature, his name. Hallelujah. He, he is not a man. He does not lie. He tells the truth. He cannot lie. The devil is the father of lies. God is the spirit of truth. Woo, we love you, Lord. Thank him for his integrity. Thank him for his integrity. Lord, we love you. Oh, we worship you in this house. We worship you. Thank you for being good. You're a good God. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for healing bodies even right now as we worship you, as we honor you, fixing marriages, fixing families, fixing bodies, fixing lives, fixing the, the broken. Hallelujah, Lord. Raising the dead. Oh, glory. Glory to God. Fixing the blind who can't see, the deaf who can't hear, the lame who can't walk. In the name of Jesus, that organ that's not functioning. Father, we speak life into that. That, that, that organ that needs to be quickened right now. Father, I thank you for the presence of your quickening life, your quickening power. Oh, glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Oh, glory. Glory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Woo, glory to God, there's victory here. Amen. I said there's victory here. Amen. It says, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. It's talking about the promise to, to Father Abraham. In the presence of him whom he believed, God who gives life. He's a giver. Thank him for the integrity of our God. He, he forever gives. This is what he does. He doesn't change his nature is, is constant. I, I truly believe this church that when, when God finds people who thank Him for His integrity, they experience His nature. When you thank Him that He gives, you experience the giver. When you thank Him, just very simply, thank you that you quicken, you give life. Thank you, you give life. You know, can you see yourself where God's put you in a situation where the occasion has demanded you to raise the dead? Can you see yourself having to raise somebody from the dead? Jesus said, you'll, you'll do these things and, and even greater works than what I did. Can you see yourself in a room where there's a dead body and you simply say, Father, thank you for your integrity. You're a giver and what you give is life. Through these hands, through this mouthpiece, I release that life to this body. Yes. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. You know what faith is? 
It's believing the integrity of the one who's given a promise. That's what faith is. You believe in the integrity of the one who's given you that promise. In the presence of him whom he believed who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did exist. Oh man. What's missing that needs to be there? Call those things that be not as though they are. What is not there that needs to get there? Call it to get there. That's what faith does. You know what faith is? Let me say what faith is. And some of you, you know, we, we can, you know, wait upon the Lord and that's right and proper. Is someone's music on? I can hear something. Oh, that's the crash. Man, the crash are noisier than the big people. Amen. These little people make so much noise. How can something so small make such big racket? I think we can increase the volume in here too. Amen. Let me say this. Faith. You know what faith, faith, faith does? Faith, you know, we do so well. That, that's what I was going to say. Thank you, Holy Ghost. We do so well waiting on the Lord, and we, we need to wait upon the Lord. He renews our strength. Who does that? Who gets in a secret place, closes the door to hear from him, gets still long enough to hear the still small voice of the Holy One? Amen. You need to do that. You need to practice the presence of God and practice being silent in the presence of God to hear him. We need to do that. But you know what? Faith isn't just waiting, God, would you move? What I've found is when I move, he moves. It's this action attraction. When I, when I, when I move, having heard it attracts the power of God. And when the power, the supernatural power of God meets the natural, the natural has to shift and the supernatural supersedes the natural. Come on now. You hear me? Faith is actions done in the natural that induce a supernatural reaction that gives birth to some quickenings. Amen. Amen. Come on, who's going to induce some things today? Faith does that. And what does faith look like? It looks like some things done in the natural. You know, it didn't look super spiritual, filling water pots. But that was an action done in the natural that induced a supernatural reaction. Oh, man. Thank you, Lord. It didn't look very natural for the man with the withered hand to stretch forth his hand. I mean, who can stretch forth their hand? It's just a natural act. But it's an action that induced something supernatural. I remember being in a meeting like this where I had an ankle rupture, just ripped tendons and all sorts. It happened on the Tuesday. This was on the Thursday. I had just hands laid on me. No, no, no words, just... A slap on the head, literally like that. It was probably even harder because I felt it. I, I still have memories of that feeling. The minister was wearing a big college ring, and I didn't feel the Holy Ghost, didn't feel nothing. I felt the ring on my forehead, you know. I don't know. You don't have to feel anything in the presence of God to know God's movement. You just have to believe. And Jesus said, if you lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. So, so if you just thank God, okay, here's a believer who believes in your power. He's laid hands on somebody who needs it. There's been obedience there. There's been a natural action that, is indu that has induced a supernatural reaction. Thank you for my healing. And I just thanked him, lifted up my, my hands, and instantaneously my, my, my knee was, my, 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 the Lord, my ankle, thank you. But the Lord said, run. I, I heard it in my spirit, run. And the moment I moved, it induced a supernatural, a supernatural result, quickening totally healed what is God asking you to do are you pleading with God Lord restore my marriage and you wait on him and you just wait but you do nothing you're not the first one to step out the boat and forgive and walk in love you believe in God for a breakthrough financially and you're just waiting on God to do something there is a natural action that will induce a supernatural reaction. It might be a seed that you need to sow. It may be something that you need to do, an investment that God will lead you to do. But it, there is a natural outworking. Come on, somebody. Father, I thank you for your Holy Ghost, your spirit that speaks to us. Thank you even this week, Lord. Supernatural happenings. Oh, man.
miracles. We talked about miracles. We talked about the integrity of God's word, the integrity of God, and how He's He's a He's a one He's one who makes a way. We sang it: way maker, miracle worker. Thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea and a path through the mighty waters, who brings forth the chariot and horses, the army and the power. They shall lie down together. They will not rise. They are extinguished. They are quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness. Amen. He's a way maker. This is what he does. Rivers in the desert. Well, it's so dry. I feel like I'm in a wilderness. Well, believe the integrity of our God. He's a way maker. You do good singing about it. Now, do good believing it. In Psalm 107, it says, verse 2, Let the redeemer of the Lord say so. Ooh, who has been redeemed from the, from the hand of God. Who's the redeemed of the Lord here? Amen. Now notice this, very quick. Verses 20, this is Psalms 107 verse 20. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from, from their destructions. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness. I'm going to say that again. Oh, that men and women in Faith Life Center would give thanks to God for his goodness. Now notice, just one second, just one second, just one. Natural, but done from your spirit. It looks natural. Men and women giving thanks for his goodness, but notice what comes afterwards. And for his wonderful works to the children of men, let them praise, let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare the works with rejoicing. This is a picture. This is a picture of somebody who goes down, verse 23, who goes down to the sea in ships, who do business on great waters. They see the works of the Lord and His wonders in the deep. I want to see His wonders. I want to see the deep things of the Spirit. Go to those precarious deep waters. How? Deep worship. Deep praise. Oh, that man would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works, his works with rejoicing. Ooh. I'm going to give somebody in this place just 20 seconds to give him thanks for his wonder and his glorious nature and the integrity of our Father to do mighty wonders in your life and in this place and in this nation lord we worship you we worship you we go down as a fellowship into deep waters and worship you and we shall be the people who shall see taste and see of your goodness and your grace and your mercy Woo! we worship you 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 Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Woo! Hallelujah. Woo! Glory. Tell somebody he's mighty. He's mighty. Come on, tell him. He's mighty and he's worthy of all praise. Tell him. You can go ahead and take your seed. Oh, he's good. He's good. He's good. Amen. Youth, can you stand up for a moment? Father, we thank you for the youth standing up. We thank you for their lives. We thank you, Lord, for what you'll do. We thank you, Lord, that you see every single one of them. You see where they're at. You see their questions, and you're not threatened by their questions. Father, you help them in the name of Jesus. I pray that they would have a supernatural time this morning. In Jesus' precious name, amen. We love you guys. You know that. Do you know we love you? Do you love us too? Amen. I feel your love. Do any other big people feel the love? You know, I think we can feel a little bit more. You know, we love you guys and you lo love us. I'm just waiting for one youth to say, I love you. <laughs> Thank you. I'll take that. You guys can get out of here and go to youth. Amen. You can go and have a great time. Amen.
I want to welcome anyone who's here for the very first time. If this is your first time here at Faith Life Center, I extend a very warm welcome to you. Um, could you just um, wave back at me if this is your first time at Faith Life? Just say, hey, welcome, 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 welcome. Hey, good seeing you. Good seeing you. It's so good having you here. Uh, it's awesome having you here. I'm so pleased that you got to uh, find us, uh, wherever you did find us. What the stewards are doing, if you can keep your hand raised, we'd love to uh, put something in your hand. It's a, it doesn't sound very exciting, but just uh, give, me a, give me a moment to explain. If you fill out this uh, new here card, we have something for you. If you take that, we'll do a trade, all right? We'll do a deal right here in front of everyone. We'll do a deal. If you fill, fill that card out, and you hand it into the connect desk at the back there, there'll be some real smarty people there who will be glad to assist you. If you just give that in at the end of the service, we will give you a gift. It's a welcome pack. And in that, there's a devotion, and you'll be certainly blessed by that. And, uh, and so fill it out. Go back there at the end of the service, and you'll be glad you did. We'd love to stay in contact with you. Amen. And uh, awesome. Thank you for coming. We hope you come back. And all those who are joining us on live stream, uh, we are happy that you're joining us too. Amen. You know, something that came, came out in my spirit uh, when we were praying, we had a wonderful week of prayer. Amen. Amen. Prayer and fasting, is ju- it was just electric. Some people took time off work to come. It really blessed us to, to see that. It, there was great unction to pray. And some important things were prayed out. Um, what came to my spirit was the helper has heard and there is no bounds to his help. And I just, it just really, it really encouraged me. The helper has heard, and there's no bounds to his help. You know, and when you think of um, the anointing, you know, the anointing knows no boundaries. And so for those who are watching us on live stream, you know, what we're experiencing here, you can experience right in your room, right there. Amen. But there's nothing quite like being here, Right. And so we would love to see you. We'd love to shake your hand, get to know you uh, a little bit. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Prayer is important. Prayer prevails. Um, We, we, uh, like I said, had a great week. Uh, We believe in the power of prayer. um, And we believe in what God will God, God, what God does and what He makes available for for us when we do when we do pray. During the week, we made mention of an intercessor called Daniel Nash. He was the intercessor for Charles Finney. Who's heard of Charles Finney? You know, great uh, voice of awakening in many, many places. Well, what Daniel Nash did, he was a prayer. He was an intercessor. He would go into the cities that um, Charles was scheduled to go into minister two weeks, three weeks prior. And um, he would hire out an apartment, a basement, and he would pray for two weeks. Amen. And prayer pre- prepares. And what happened was they saw tremendous results because all opposition was removed, all resistance was dealt with. See, prayer is so important. Pre- prayer prepares. Amen. They would even go after people, the most difficult, uh, notorious individuals in the town. And, and, and they would pray, pray, he would pray prayers like this, Lord, apprehend them by your spirit. Um, amen. And they would saturate the place. I think of Azusa Street and William Seymour. Uh, there was such prayer that, that was done that uh, it was tangible. People got off the train in L.A. and would stand foot on the platform at the Grand Station and would be hit by the power of God. Amen. People would be filled with the Holy Ghost praying in, praying in other tongues. It's awesome. And I heard one minister say that with every one voice of awakening, every, for every one voice, how many know we're voices? Amen. This man of God said, for every one voice, like Charles Finney, there requires seven intercessors that God will rise up to pray, where no one knows their name, no one knows their fa- face, they're not famous, uh, they don't have an international ministry, but they do have the ear of God. Hallelujah. There is a lot of unsung heroes. And thank God we're not, we're not trying to and look in for praise of men. Amen. But there's a lot of, a lot of people, when we get to heaven, we'll, we'll go, wow, look at their reward. 
Look what they did for the kingdom of God. And no one knew them. But they were the catalyst. Amen. Amen. Turn your Bibles this morning, please, to Matthew's Gospel. Matthew uh, chapter 13. You know where I'm going, don't you? Anyone understanding the parable of the, the sower? Man, oh, this is great. Mark's Gospel. Mark said, if you don't... You know, um, if you don't understand this, forget all of the parables. You won't, you, won't get any, you won't understand anything else unless you understand this. I can't get off it, so I'm going to stay with it. Amen. And so we're going to deal with something, and you know, I believe it's going to really help you this morning. It says here in Matthew chapter 13, verses uh, 18, Therefore hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, that's a problem, a lack of understanding, that, that's an issue. If anyone does not understand it, when the wicked one comes, then the wicked one will come. Where you don't understand the word of God, the wicked one comes and robs it, takes it from you. Um, that, that is he who receives the seed by the wayside. Someone say wayside. Mark chapter 4, 15 says, immediately saying comes to steal the word sown. So we could be sat in church, but we don't, you know, we hear the word of God and, and we think that's enough. I mean, no, it's not enough. You need to understand what it's saying. Otherwise, it will be stolen from you. Now, we don't want to hear the word. Why, why waste time, hear the word, receive the word, and it not produce anything in our lives? So we have to contend for something called understanding. We, we need to gain understanding of the, these things. Amen. Um, a person with a revelation or understanding of the Word of God is, is not at the mercy of a culture going crazy. How many know this culture is going, society is going crazy? And uh, if society call us peculiar, it's a good indication to us because we, we're not going crazy. But if you, if you have understanding, come on now, if you have understanding... Then, um, or revelation, you're not at the mercy of a culture going mad. Amen. And so understanding is very, very, very important. And one thing that we said last week is, when truth becomes a conviction, then um, it becomes an action. And you could put it this way, until it becomes an action, it remains, you remain unfruitful. The word is always full of fruit, it's always full of power, but until you put action to, now what have we been saying all morning already? You know, uh, faith is a natural act action, how do we put it? Then it juices a supernatural reaction, amen. So, so what will give you, what will uh, get you moving in the direction of the word, put in action to the word of God that you hear, is revelation, understanding it. See, people, people who hear, hey, don't forsake the assembly of yourselves together, that's what the Word of God says. If you have no revelation of that, you don't go to church. You don't assemble. But, it, but when it gets, becomes a revelation, then it, 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 you carry a conviction. Man, I can't forsake my assembling with my brothers and my sisters. I'm going to church. Can I have a better amen? Amen. 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 Action. Verses 20, but he who received the word on stony, this is the second type, stony type of ground, this is he who hears the word of God and immediately receives it with joy. I mean, you get happy because you, you, you understand it. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a little while. And when tribulation or persecution arises for the word, you know what persecution is? It is pressure. That pressure is trying to uh, uh, separate you from the word you've heard. That's what it is. Why? Because no depth, shallow. You want a definition of a shallow person? This is it. Somebody who hears the word is, um, receives it with joy. Now, it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. Who understands it, receives it with joy. But when persecution or pressure comes for the word's sake, they stumble, they fall, they quit, they give up. That's a definition that Jesus gives of a shallow, a shallow person. We don't want to be shallow people. Amen. 
Amen. There ought to be more depth to us. What? This, what I'm seeing right now that is contrary to the word that I've heard, that I rejoiced about, this that I'm seeing that is opposite to what I've just been dancing about, is not going to take the seed out of my soil. Come on now. I have more depth than that. Anyone else going to say that? This, this is what I've started saying. This is what I'm practicing. As a, How many know before I'm a pastor, I'm a believer? <laughs> Amen. And so this is what I, I have to do the word too, right? I'm, I literally... I say that. I have, when pressure comes that is contrary to the promise I've laid hold of, I say, there's more depth in me than that. I have more depth. You can't snatch this. Who do you think? This circumstance. Who do you think you are? You can't snatch this word from me. It's too deep. Your arm is not long enough to take the word. It's too deep in me. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mark's gospel, Mark 4.16 says, These are they sown on stony ground. When they, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves. And so endure for a, for a time afterward when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake. Immediately they are offended. Immediately they are effect, offended. You know, the persecution from people, uh, really um, it is outplayed in mockery. Anyone ever been mocked for what you believe? You know, people may mock it, they can't, they can't stop it, but it's, it's this, um, it's pressure. It's pressure to take the word. That's what it is. It's pressure to take the word. So grateful hearing my, my, my girls talk about, of course, you know, high school and new kids coming in. And, you know, um, one, of my, one of my girls was, was explaining how in their class they were talking about, you know, what they want to be when they're older and, and what have you. One of my girls says, um, I want to lead a church. I want to, I want to be a, a preacher and a, and a pastor and tell people about Jesus. And, and they were looking at her kind of like laughing and sniggering. You, you, you want to be, what? You want to lead a church? You want to lead a church? Like, what, what does that even look like, you know? And they were, she was explaining, you know, how their face got crumpled up, and, you know, how they were trying, they were mocking. Now, um, what is that? That's a form of persecution, something that the Spirit of God has been dealing with her heart about concerning her future. That's a seed gone in her ground. What is that mockery, that pressure trying to do? It's trying to take that out of her heart. You hear me? And so she had been re reading, they do their personal studies, and, you know, we're not like those pastors who crack the whip and, hey, you better be in the Word of God. You know, we let their love for God draw them and woo them for personal relationship with Him. And my girl was uh, reading the night before how if you are unashamed to stand up before men and declare that He is your Lord and Savior, then, um, th then he will stand up for you. Amen. Don't deny him. He's not going to deny you. And so she said, that just really strengthened me. That word strengthened me to just be very confident in what I'm going to be doing in my future. She didn't let the pressure take the seed. But a lot of people get offended, get emotional. Hmm. You watch out for the critics. A mighty man of God, a great man of God was asked a question. I thought it was a good question. What is the biggest problem in the body of Christ? What is the biggest, biggest problem in the body of Christ? And uh, this guy who asked the question, he got the answer, but it wasn't an answer he was expecting. The answer was this. <clears throat> Excuse me. This man of God asked the Lord, what is the biggest problem in the body of Christ? Amen. And the Lord said, it is your dogged determination to correct one another. Your dogged determination to correct one another. Whew. Always looking for fault. Always looking for something to accuse. You know, the way you say stay safe from all of that, not just, you know, being somebody pressurized to be separated from the word you have received, but to stay safe from being the accuser. I heard it even during the week. Any accusations, you know where it came from. Didn't come from God. Didn't come from the Spirit of God. It comes from the accuser. 
the spirit of the accuser. Best way to stay safe is you don't dabble in fault finding. Can I have a big living amen in this place? Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know what a fool does? They see the, down, the, the downfall of somebody else as a topic of discussion. A wise person sees it as a warning unto himself because he too has flesh. Can I have a big amen? amen. And we put no trust or, or, or uh, reliance on that. The Amplified in Mark 4, 16 says, oh, they're offended, they're displeased, they stumble and fall away. There needs to be some consistency. Amen. Consistent. Not up and down. The guy received it with joy. He received the word with joy. But he didn't maintain his joy. Consistency always, always trumps intensity. Consistency. It was Gloria Copeland. She said, that's where lies the power. It's in consistency. Amen. There's a, I'm telling you, there's a reason why we're going over this. Because if we get this, I'm telling you, if we get this, we'll, we'll, we'll understand a lot. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. John 14, verse 1. Jesus says, do not let your heart be troubled. Who, whose responsibility is this? He said, do not let your, who, who, if your heart's troubled, who let it be troubled? I think so. we're so quick to blame the circumstance. Circumstance has that much power over your life? What goes on in your heart is, is up to you. We're talking about the ground, the condition of your heart. He said, don't let it. Don't let it be troubled. Whew, some, some put your hand right here on your heart, on your, on your core. On your, on your, put it on your head as well. One hand here, one hand here. I will not let myself, I will not let myself be troubled. Come on, somebody. No, I'm not going to ride that solar coaster always up and down. Ooh, come on, I'm preaching better than you're saying amen right now. Amen. We're not going on the roller, we're not going on the solar coaster. Someone say soul control. Your spirit is master. Your soul is your servant. Your body is your slave. Your spirit is your master. It's the master of your being. Amen. United with Christ. Your soul is your servant. Your body is your slave. Amen. Amen. Okay. What was the third type of soil? Thorny, Matthew 13, 22. Now he who received seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he, not the word, he becomes unfruitful. So here's a guy who, he's received the word. Man, I received the word. Why is it not working? I heard the word. Why is it not working? The cares. <laughs> cares people care too much cares of this world deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he not the word he the man becomes unfruitful oh man now you got to watch money because he will try and master you Jesus said you can't serve two masters in other words, money will try and be a master. You either serve God, but you can't serve God and serve mammon, money. Which tells us money will try and lord itself over you. So what, which one you choose? Today, what day is it? September the 8th. You make a decision of quality. Amen. To make Jesus the Lord of your life and divorce yourself from the lordship of mammon, money. In other words, it will not tell you what you can or cannot do. How many people consult their, their wallet? Oh, we can't do that because we've only got a certain amount. Are you led by money or led by the Spirit of God? You, can't be, you cannot be, <laughs> you cannot have God as your master and 
when you're listening to the master money. You can't do it. Because God is going to tell you to do stuff that requires money, and by sight, the money won't be there. I'm not talking about being uh, negligent and doing your due diligence and planning. How many know good financial stewardship is really important? But you cannot be dictated to by the money in the bank. Oh, we can do it because we have money in the bank. Hang on a minute. That money in the bank may be for something else. The Spirit of God will lead you on those things. Amen. <clears throat> How do I get onto that? Deceitfulness of riches. Mastery over riches closes the door to greed. It closes the door to unethical business practices. It closes the door to discontentment. Oh, man. Money is, I have, I've said it so many times, I've preached it so many times, and I'm going to get on to the main emphasis I want to get into it in, in a few minutes. But money in your hand is a tool. Money in your heart, poison. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Thank you. We love God. I, I'm watchful. Oh, I love this flavor of ice cream. No, no, no. I like this flavor, uh, th this flavor of ice cream. I love Jesus. Amen. Oh, I love that type of car. Well, watch it. You're nurturing a love for things that require money to buy it. Express your love for Him. Seek Him first. And all those things will be simply added to you. Matthew 6, Amen. 33. Amen. <clears throat> he said, He who receives the word among the thorns is he who hears the word. He understands the word. But the cares of this world and deceitfulness of riches choke the word of God. And he becomes unfruitful. Now, don't, get me, don't misunderstand me. God, there's no doubt God wants his children prosperous. Who believes that in this room? God wants you prosperous. I'll read a couple of scriptures. Uh, in Ezekiel 34, verse 29, it says, I will provide for them renowned plantations from the English Standard Version. Renowned businesses. Someone say, I'll take that. Renowned businesses. He said, I will provide for them renowned businesses. Who's a, a business owner in this place? <clears throat> There's a few business people in this place. Come on. Renowned businesses. Renowned businesses. What about this one? Psalm 78 verses 18 from the New Living Translation. It says, they, uh, stubbornly, they stubbornly tested God in their hearts, demanding the, the foods they crave. It's one thing to believe God for things. It's another thing to demand of him. Once again, trust him. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Okay, I want to get on to good ground. Number four, Luke, Luke chapter 8. <clears throat> Everyone following me so far? Verse 15, it says, But the one that fell on the good ground are those who have heard the word with a noble and good heart. They keep it. Someone say keep it. And they bear fruit with patience or with endurance. If you want to produce a hundred, sixty, or thirty-fold of the word, you want to produce. I think everyone in this room would say, I want, to, I want to see production of the word. You've got to overcome wayside or a lack of understanding. You've got to overcome stony or a lack of depth, overcome persecution or pressure. You have to master those things. And number three, you've got to overcome the cares of this world and deceit deceitfulness of riches there is a whole bunch of deception going on in in out there the enemy is trying to deceive people and you've got to watch that hallelujah he said but he, but these are the ones sown on good ground who hear the word mark 420 now I know I'm jumping all over the place. Those who hear the word accepts it. Accepts it and bears fruit some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. Someone say accepts it. Anytime God is doing a new thing, I don't like new things. <clears throat> And don't like when God is do, on the scene, he's doing something fresh. You're always going to find two kinds of people. 
you're going to have one group of people, two groups of people. First group is a group who receive it, accept, accepts the new, and yields to it. Yields to it. But then the second group of people are those who they resist and push against it. Think about um, when, the, when, when the church was born on the day of Pentecost. Amen. And the Spirit of God came in that place, that upper room, like a mighty rushing wind. You've got 3,000 people who receive it, who are added to the church. Amen. You know, of course, the 140, 120 in the upper room. But then you have a whole bunch of people receiving it, yielding to it. But then you've got another group of people. What are they doing? They're mocking it. They're mocking it. Oh, man, these guys are just, they're just drunk. You're going to always see that. And what you need to be comfortable with is the new. Amen. And learn how to overcome the pressure of the mockers. There are the resistors. There's the resistors. And there are those who receive, the receivers. Who are you? So it, the, the, ever since... Even when you know, Jesus walked the earth, those people who received his teaching, people who rejected his teaching, mocked his teaching. So you've got to get used to it. There's always going to be those two groups of people. People who receive, and that's us. Amen. Those who accept it, that's us. Amen. And those who reject it, they're always going to be out there. So just be okay with it. There's going to be that pressure. But do you know what we need to help us overcome that pressure? Is one another. Can I have a big amen? amen. We are going to need one another. Turn, turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Hallelujah. This is where I'm trying to get at. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Because here, here's the deal. We're overcoming lack of understanding. Whoo, come on now. We may do a series just on that, how to gain understanding from the Word of God. Would that benefit anyone in the room? Yeah. Amen. What if we did a study on how to be a deep sheep, where we had some depth? How, how to get the Word so steeped in our heart that the, you know, those little devils who have just tiny little weedy hands can't reach in to take the seed out of our, out of our ground. Who would like to learn how to get the Word so deep? Amen. When pressure arise, when mockery arise, you are unfazed. Who would like to master that? We ought to do a series on that. What about dealing with cares? Learning how to cast cares effectively and not just pick them up once you've cast them. You know, so easy you know, in church to cast cares upon the Lord and then pick them up before you leave and take them, take them home with you. What about overcoming deception? We've got to learn how to overcome deception. In other words, not walk by how you see, how, 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 uh, not walk by sight, but walk by faith. Because, because what Satan does to deceive, he masquerades himself as an angel of light to appear like this being is being sent by God. It's deception. We have to overcome that, and we're learning these things. But the good ground person, they accept it, even though so many people reject it. Think of, yeah, but, you know, um, surely the majority are, are always right. What about Joshua and Caleb? Remember Joshua and Caleb? Joshua was literally one in a million. Caleb was literally one in a million. All the other bunch, you know, there's two million guys... Only Joshua and Caleb got into the promised land. Why? Because all the other ones saw themselves. They had an identity issue. They saw themselves as grasshoppers. They saw the giants, the fortified cities. They said, I see myself. They had an identity crisis. They, they saw themselves as too small to possess what God had promised, and they even entertained thoughts of what other people were thinking of them. And they, the Bible says in Numbers 13 that they saw themselves as grasshoppers in their own sight and in, in their sight. 
You don't build fortified cities, walls that you can read about, so fortified you could ride chariots on top of these walls. Circling cities like Jericho, you don't build such walls to keep grasshoppers out. (laughs) Joshua chapter 6 verse 1 tells us it was, they built those walls because of the of the nation of the children of Israel. Hallelujah. But they had an identity issue. My, my, my. And as a result, God spoke to Moses and he said, the, uh, because of their complaining, if you go back and study study this, you'll you'll see that God rejected them because of their, their lack of courage. And belief in his integrity and what he had promised. Joshua, one in a million, he got in. Caleb, he got in. Oh, man. Minority. You have to be okay with being the minority. I I told my kids. These are some of the messages I'm I'm preaching to my kids in in my house. Be okay with being the minority. Amen. It's okay to stand out and believe this stuff when no one else is believing this stuff. They may mock it, but they cannot stop it. But you know what we need? To keep this word and hold fast to this word and not give in to the pressure is we need one another so that we can keep on going. I need you so I can keep on going. Do you know what we need? Encouragement. The person on the aisle next to you, the person in front of you, behind you, beside you, needs encouragement. And that encouragement is fuel to them to keep on going when they find themselves mocked, persecuted, pressurized to give up and quit, throw in the towel, call it a day, walk away. They need something that we have to become really good at in order to see the hundredfold, the sixty, thirtyfold in our lives, the production of the word. We need to be good at encouraging one another. Are you there in First First Thessalonians chapter three, verses one? It says, "Therefore, oh man, therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good." To be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God and fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you. Notice, he was sent, Timothy was sent to help establish their faith. Amen. To establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. They needed an encourager. They needed Timothy to help them be established in their belief in the Word. Why? Because they felt the pressure. Amen. They felt the pressure, and they needed some, they needed this, this, this encourager, Timothy, to strengthen, encourage them, whoo, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourself know that we are appointed to this. Paul was, was saying, I, you know, you hear about all the shakings and the dealings and all the persecution, all the pressure and all this stuff. I, I, I do not, I, I don't want you to feel the weight of what's going on in my life or in your life. So I'm sending some aid to help you keep on going and stay established in the faith. Hallelujah. Amen. And not quit. I've been praying, Lord, make me a better encouragement. Hallelujah. Encourage means to put courage in. That's what it is. To encourage, it literally means to put courage. Remember uh, what, what God told uh, Joshua in Joshua chapter 1? He said, be, be strong and very courageous. That tells me strength is needed or some establishment is needed in the possessor's life. And courage is needed in the possessor's life, possessor of promise, possessor of sinners, in order to effectively possess. How, how do I get courage put into me? Receiving encouragement. Thank you for that one amen. Amen. 
Thank you, sister. Amen. I'll take that as an encouragement. Amen. All right, look at this. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, from the New American Bible Revised Edition. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and God of all encouragement, who encourages us in our every affliction. Isn't that good? So that we may be able to encourage those who are in any affliction with the encouragement with which we ourselves are encouraged by God. Who's ever been encouraged by God? That's not just for you. It's for other people too. He said, he said so that we're able to encourage those who are in any affliction, no matter what's going on, with the encouragement which we have received by God, for as Christ's sufferings overflow to us, so through Christ does our encouragement also overflow. If we are afflicted, it is for your encouragement and salvation. If we are encouraged, it is for your encouragement which enables you, notice this, what encouragement does, enables you to endure. The same sufferings that we suffer, our hope for you is firm. For we know that we are we know that as you share in the sufferings, you also share in the encouragement. Do you know what encouragement does? It enables you to endure. It enables you to keep on going. This is what encouragement is. It's like fuel. If you run out of fuel, guess what happens? You can't keep on going. This is a mechanic. He understands these things. You, know? you understand that? Anyone found that out? If you run out of fuel, you cannot keep on going. What do you need if you're, you're, you're going low? And the E light's gone on. What do you need? You need some fuel to what? Keep on going. So that's what encouragement's like. It's like fuel. I just can't keep on going. No, no, listen. No, you can. You just need some fuel. What do you need? Some encouragement. So you can endure and keep on going. Do you know how many people are uh, tempted to quit? Weekly, who's, who's, who's had quitting thoughts? Man, this is a great church. I mean, two people, right? This section, I want to meet you. <laughs> Take you out for dinner, because I, I need some, I, I want to find out what you're doing, amen. We've all had uh, thoughts of quitting. Yeah. I remember talking you know, to my pastor, um, this is a while back now. And, and I said, man, I, I was having, I just, ministry is tough and all this stuff. And he was listening to me. I was having one of those fleshly moments. I was fleshing out. You understand what I'm saying? And, um, and I said, I, I, I just feel like quitting. And he just started laughing. I thought, this is not very encouraging. But what was happen, happening is he was like, huh, it's working. It's working. The, you are a threat to the enemy. He's just trying to take you out of position. And he started, he started speaking into my life and encouraging me. And I tell you what, from a conversation and prayers that went forth and, uh, that, that day, it fueled me. My tank was, was close to empty at the start of that phone call. But once we, you know, loved and said bye and stuff like that, you know, um, it, I had fuel to do what? Keep on going. Because that is what encouragement is. Notice this. 1 Thessalonians 5.11. A few more minutes here. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 from the New Living Translation. So encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. Hallelujah. If he, uh, Hebrews 10.25 from the New Living Translation says, Let us not neglect are meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Amen. Now, you, you could have stayed at home today and watched online and benefited from the broadcast. And, you know, thank God for this facility, right, to, to enjoy the teachings and things like that. But, you know, um, what you could not have done, staying at home, is... Be present to encourage somebody. You can't necessarily do that virtually. 
We need personal contact. Amen. We need to smell each other, right? Feel each other. Touch each other. Mess with each other. Amen. <laughs> I like this guy. Amen. Amen. I just feel encouragement being right here. Oh, man, he wants to high five me. I feel even more encouragement. Woo. It's a man of God, the great guy. He said, don't, don't, don't be like those who neglect coming together because also what you're neglecting is helping each other stay full of fuel to keep on going. Oh, man. I know this is simple. Acts 4, 36 to 37 from the, from the Passion Translation. It says, there was a, a Levite from Cyprus named Joseph who sold his farmland and placed the proceeds at the feet of the, of the apostles. They nicknamed him Barnabas or Encourager. He went from Joseph to Barnabas. Now, my name, my name is Joel, and I have a nickname sometimes. You know, my family members, you know, they call me, um, you know, Jodge uh, or Jojo. When, I, when I'm, you know, when my girls have babies, I'll be Jojo Popper. That's going to be my name, you know. Evangeline, my wife, sometimes we call her Evs or Evie, you know, but Evs. Um, that's our nickname. How did this guy go from being Joseph, not to Jay, not to Joe, but to Barnabas? I mean, it was like complete change of name. Because everywhere this guy went, he had a reputation of what? Encouraging everybody. You get around Joseph, you're going to experience some encouragement. Man, if you feel like you're running out of steam, running out of fuel, whoo! Man, you're happy when Joseph rocks up. Why? He's going to put some fuel in your tank to keep on, to keep on, to keep on going. Amen. He was an encouragement. Well, how did he get this name? Literally, the encourager. He sold his land, brought all the money, and placed it before the apostles. Evidently, his giving encouraged them. Do you know how you can encourage other people? It's by you be a blessing to people. Hallelujah. I was so encouraged. I remember, thank you, uh, Rob. When, um, when we were fitting out and refurbing, some of you may remember many, many years ago, our children's ministry uh, facility, and we were behind because it cost you know, thousands, thousands of pounds to do this stuff. And we just said, we didn't make a big to-do, hey, who wants to you know, so, and we need X amount and what have you. We, we just said, hey, if you want to sow into, the, into this project, we would be so happy for you to contribute, you know, do what the Lord tells you to do. But we were behind by, you know, a few thousand pounds. And the Lord said to me on that morning, when we had to pay the builder the next day, the Lord said, do not tell the church the deficit. Just thank the church for sowing. Um... And don't try and whip up another offering for this deficit. You understand know what I'm saying? There was a guy who woke up in London that morning and had the leading to find a church in Manchester. He Googled. Thank God for Google. You know, he found Faith Church in Manchester. And he found us. He drove all the way up. He heard me talking about the new rooms and what have you. And he wrote a check for 4,000 pounds. We had a deficit of just shy of 4,000 pounds. I was encouraged. I was encouraged. Amen. People's giving will encourage. You don't realize, well, I don't know what to say, but I'm feeling like the Lord's wanted me to encourage them to keep on going. Well, um, you got something to give them? We have to get better at this. The children workers looking after our kids. When, when was the last time you encouraged them? Not just with words, but gave them something. Giving fuels people to keep on, to keep on going. Hallelujah. A few more scriptures. Acts 11, 21. 
It says, And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Then the news of these came. These things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. And they sent out Barnabas. They sent out this encourager to go as far as Antioch. And when he had he came and had seen the grace of God. He was glad and encouraged them all. Of course, because that's what he does. That, the, that with purpose of heart, they should continue. Can you see this? With the Lord. Courage to carry on. This is what encouragement does. It helps you keep on going. Verse 24, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and full of faith. And a great many people were added to the, to the, to the Lord. You know one of the great ev evidences of being filled with the Holy Spirit and full of faith? You know one of the greatest evidences of being full of God's Spirit and full of faith is you encourage people. You're constantly saying, hey man, you're looking good today. I believe you're going to have the greatest week. Of, and we're not just talking, you know, just hype. You find something genuine. Hey, how you worshipped in spur and in truth. That blessed us. Keep that up. Keep that up. Keep that sincerity. Never let anything to detach you from sincere, heartfelt worship. The pressure of performance. Man, it blessed us. And I'm, I'm not just saying... I'm encouraging him. Do you know what this will do? Help him to keep on going. Hallelujah. Hey, your business. You go into someone's shop. Man, you, you're taking care of this place. This is, this is great. I can see. I can feel the, the motive of, of this store. is not just to make money, but to provide a service and provide products and your attention to detail. Man, kudos to you. This is a great place. I'll be back. What is that going to do? It's going to encourage them to keep on going. Come on, somebody. I know this is simple this morning, but people need it. Why? Because those who are on good ground, they accept it despite the mockery and the pressure. They accept the word when sometimes they're the minority. But they keep it. They stay with it. They keep on going because they've realized I've got a dean in my life who's going to put fuel in my tank. Amen. I've got a Femi in my life who's going to encourage me to keep on going, not throw in the towel when I want to quit, because we have all have those moments. You hear me? One of the greatest ways you can encourage people to keep on going is simply being there. Last scripture, after Paul got shipwrecked and left, Malta in Acts 20, 28, they got to some other place, and in verse 15 it says, And from there, when the brethren heard about us, they came to meet us as far as that place. Amen. And three inns. Man, sounds like an English pub somewhere. When Paul saw them, after all that he had been through, you know, shipwrecked and snake bitten and all kinds of stuff and all the trials of life. It says, well, when he saw the brothers, when he saw them, he thanked God. He just saw them. He, they didn't even do anything. But they were present. They were there. He saw them. He gave thanks to God. And he took courage from them. Just going around to someone's house and you know, maybe they've had a bereavement or something and just you sit with them and say, look, I'm, I don't have time to get things together and bring anything, but I'm just, I'm here. They'll take courage from that. If you can bring something, if you can give something, like Barnabas who sold his property and brought it, it was an encouragement. It was an encouragement. But, but just being present. My wife is up in uh, Preston this morning. We're celebrating three years. Three years. Today. Amen. And so she, she said, I, 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 where I'm going. I'm going to want to be an encouragement to them. So is some of the members of the leadership to go up and support them. Just to, what, to preach? No. no. To, 
to give someone that note, just to be there because you can take courage from that. It was encouraging when I saw people came to church. It wasn't just me this morning. Amen. It would have been very, dis- very discouraging if no one showed up this morning. If everyone decided, you know, it's just a coincidence. Everyone decided to watch online. It would have been, I, w- I would have not been able to take courage. When you come, it encourages. Being present fuels. Hallelujah. I said, we'll end the service. You know, I'm going to have um, Oye Ni come, and, and uh, Renny is then going to, you know, she, she's going to bring the announcements and things like that, and we'll close. And I, and I ask you to do one thing this morning. Don't, not to race off and be quick to get out of here, but um, just, just find at least one person to have a decent conversation with and encourage them. And I'm telling you, you'll be putting something in them. Fuel to keep on going. Because we're going to keep on going. So say, I'm going to keep on going. I'm going to keep on keeping on. Amen. I'm not going to quit. So say, I'm not going to quit. I accept the word. I hold on to the word. I keep pressing forward. I do this one thing. I forget the past. And I press towards the mark of the high calling that I have in God. Sometimes you've got to say these things and encourage yourself in the Lord. Amen. You've got to be good at that. Amen. And there will be times where God sends to you Barnabas. He sends to you a Timothy just to encourage you. This guy, you don't mind me saying, he, he, went, he, he went to Bulgaria prematurely. And I knew, I, I can't let this, this guy's gone to Bulgaria. I, I went to India, and then I came back. I said, where's Momcho? He was in Bulgaria. Huh. I prayed about him. I said, get on the plane, get him. So I got on the plane, and I went to Bulgaria, got, got him back. The Lord, I was his Timothy at that, that point. Amen. Huh? And we, we prayed, and he was like, okay, I'm, I'm coming back. Amen. But that wasn't just because I wanted to do that. You know, we like him, but it was the Lord sending. The Lord will send you. Be sensitive this week. The Lord will send you maybe to someone's house. Send you somewhere. Cross, cross the road and go to a neighbor's. Oh, man, forgive me for being so simple this morning, but I'm telling you, I felt it. The key to being good ground is you keep the word. You keep on keeping on. The truth of the matter is God's designed it for you to be fueled by people. Amen. So I hook up to the groups. Get in on a group. Get into a group. Come to church. Make it your business. Church ought to be the excuse for missing everything else. Oh, I wasn't in church because I was at work. I wasn't at church because I had this recreational program. I wasn't at church because... No, the church should be the excuse. Oh, no, I can't go there because of church. I can't go... You know what I'm saying? It's one, one day, one, one morning, two hours a week. Don't forsake the assembly so that you can encourage somebody. Hallelujah. Why don't you just all stand up and I'm going to have uh, Oi come. But you stand up. Hold the hand or the shoulder of the person next to you, if you will, and start praying for them. Lift them up. Pray for them. Father, I pray for the person on my left. I pray for the person on my right. Pray for them. Father, I pray. Sustain them. Encourage them. They will not quit. They will not give up and quit. Hallelujah. Lord, whatever it is you've assigned them to do, they'll continue. Father, I pray that the, a confidence will rise within them. Knowing that you started it, you will finish it. Be confident that he who has begun this good work in you will surely bring it to a flourishing finish until the return of Jesus Christ. I speak this word courage. I speak this word confidence. Oh, to my sister, to my brother, in the name of Jesus. Come on, you pray for him. You pray for him. You pray for him. Oh, they will not quit. They will not lie down and quit. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. 
Lord, what you've set them on, what you've set them on, hallelujah, they will not quit. They will not quit. They will not quit. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Oh, there's no quit in you. There is no quit in Christ. There is no quit in Christ. Do not grow weary whilst doing good. For you shall reap. You secure a due season ahead of you. You secure a due season ahead of you. If you refuse to quit, do not grow weary. You are strong, but you're finding yourself growing weary. No, stop it. Arrest it. We arrest that process in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the fuel of your spirit through these prayers. In the name of Jesus, we secure a due season just ahead of us hallelujah in the name of Jesus we pray father thank you thank you father thank you father in Jesus name hallelujah can we give him thanks give him praise Woo! hallelujah